And now we're going to have our new poet curator, John Burgess, join us. John, you get to sit at the far end down there. Okay. Any relation to Councilmember Burgess? Uh, no relation. Okay. We didn't want to have a conflict of interest. <laughs> <laughs> right. Inside job. But John, thank you very much for, for being here. Um, and you will be, you're going to be kicking off your, your session as curator with your own poem, and then you'll be curating for, for us. That's right. Great. For, for Why don't you tell us, I'll tell us and the, the audience a little bit about yourself. Um, okay. Well, I, uh, I grew up in upstate New York. I uh, spent some time on a survey crew and finishing my college degree in Montana, and I've lived in Seattle now for 22, for 22 years. Um, I think some uh, in the poet world, I was a seven-year board member of the Washington Poets Association, uh, co-founder of the Burning Word yeah. uh, Festival, which uh, is the last Saturday in April um, on Woodby Island on Green Bank Farm. It's, um, and this year, a uh, headliner is Ann Waldman out there, okay. so it should be a really good event out there. Uh -huh. um, my first book is Punk Poems from uh, Ravenna Press, yes, a small is. press, small independent press uh, out of Spokane. And uh, that's, kind of, uh, that's kind of what I bring to the table. Great. And you were also nominated twice for Poet Populist. I, should I was nominated twice. Once by uh, Brian's group, uh -huh. Chief Point of Poetry, and the year before by, um, I want to say, the Washington, it was the Washington Poets Association. Great. So what poem do you have for us today? Um, well, first I just want to say that I'm excited and a chance to bring poetry to, uh, to civic life. I've been telling everyone I'm going to make poetry civilized, <laughs> kind of fun that way. Um, I'm looking forward to introducing a lot of different voices that are participating in poetry now in, in the Seattle area. And um, as you know, the curator is a working poet, so I, I would be remiss if I didn't thank my workplace for uh, letting me uh, get away for a couple hours uh, in the afternoon a couple times a week. Uh, right. It's a great company. They believe in, in citizenship and encouraging their employees. Right. And you, to you can name the company if you wish. Uh, Pemco Insurance. Oh, no, no. <laughs> I don't say thank you. I always want to be careful about, you know, non-sponsored ads. <laughs> so <laughs> so th thanks, Nick, and uh, thanks to your office and to the City Council right. for, for this chance. And we've been also joined by Councilmember Sally Clark as well. Aurora Bridge. This is a worker's bridge, decked out in steel, swagger of five o'clock quitting time, sweat of work today, pay today, splattered with paint or plaster. Five o'clock shadows carry burdens on narrow shoulders, suspended through a concrete sky. Headphone beats, long gone workers of Pacific Bridge Company of Portland driving coffer dams, excavating a lake bottom. Driving piles, each timber 110 to 120 feet long into clay, deep mud of Lake Union, according to Jacobs and Ober plans. Productivity takes a forgetting, a turning to mindless. Five o'clock joy of done for the day, rushing home or rushing out on the happy hour town, or tired eyes shut. Work days set up in guts like pilings driven into soft mud. Five o'clock longshoreman looks out window, dreams of a view of someday something other than cement, guardrails, perhaps water or mountains, instead of infinite rush of taillights streaking red into eternity. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. We will begin with uh, Wordsworth. Curated by John Burgess, who's our curator for this uh, portion of the year. And John, you want to introduce our poet today. Mm, thank you. Um, this week I've been thinking about uh, humor. Um, humor can be, sometimes it's awkward, uh, like laughing at the wrong time. Um, I know I've been in the movie theater and been the only guy laughing, and it's a little awkward. Um, sometimes humor is therapeutic. You can laugh until you cry. It makes you feel pretty good, I think. Um, and I think with humor... It's humorous, and humorous is a homonym for the bone in your upper arm. And so I was thinking about how's humor tied to the body, and then I got the idea of the funny bone. I think, um, I think today's poet uses humor in, in a totally different way. She uses it to get to a truth, and it's usually a truth about herself or you or about someone you know. So I'm really honored today to uh, introduce Alexander Oliver. She's a Canadian poet who has performed her work at places as diverse as Lollapalooza, the National Poetry Slam, 
and the CBC Radio National Poetry Faceoff. Uh, her first book, Where the English Housewife Shines, was released in May 2007. Um, she lives in Seattle with her husband and son, where she continues to write, perform, and mentor young writers to the Richard Hugo House. Alexandra? Do I stay sitting down? Yes. I'll stay sitting down. I think that would be the best thing. I'd like to thank you for having me. Um, it's uh, Valentine's Day tomorrow, so I thought I'd read some uh, love poems. Um, well, two. There's sort of a before poem and an after poem. They're very short. <laughs> the first one is called For the Sensualist, and it's a response to all that sort of overly sensual poetry about love where there are lots of fruit and, you know, <laughs> fruit synonyms and like, or, or fruit metaphors and fruit similes. So this is my response to the fruit poetry, and it's called For the Sensualist. I met a man who made me think of cloves and pepper on the eastern coastal air, and windy wheat that cut became the loaves, and ginger in the wind that blew his hair. Another made me think of bolts of silk, another of the oranges of Spain, the shimmer of a stream of Jersey milk, and mushrooms that would mingle in the rain. I never thought of socks or moldy bread, of sandwiches that lie around neglected, that jobless wonder loafing in your bed, who leaves you feeling cheap and disrespected. So think about the world of useless oaves and tell me if you smell the scent of cloves. That's the first one. Uh, and the second one is about my husband, who um, is from the Yugos former Yugoslavia, and he's very macho and very jealous. And he has a rule that he doesn't like it when... He prefers it when I wear lovely things that he has bought me. Um, so this is a poem about him and about jealousy and about love. It's a love poem for him, and it's called Ned's Trainers. Trainers is uh, up north how we say runners, sneakers. How many times do I have to tell you to get rid of those trainers? I'll buy you new shoes, buy you many pairs. What are you doing on Saturday? We'll go shopping. Do I keep things my ex-girlfriends gave me? I'm tired of hearing about Ned, his hair, and his nice bike, and his horrible installation art. Those giant white boxes that light up the Canada Council gives him money to build. Did the Canada Council give him money so he could buy you those trainers? Those trainers are ugly. For one thing, they're white. They're all white. And they're dirty. What are you, a nurse? They look cheap, they age you, and they make you look like you're going to start running, and I'm going to have to beg you to come back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. Thanks, Alexander. Thank um, you for having me. Well, one, note, one note this week in poetry. Um, Harvey Goldner, uh, who passed away in July, he was a reader here uh, last year in the spring. Um, they published a collection of his poems, just came out, and it's called The Resurrection of Bert Ringgold. And um, I'm about three quarters of the way through it. Highly recommend it if you want a little taste of the Seattle poetry scene. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for Thank your you. information. And our curator, John Burgess, who is going to be introducing our poet populist. John? <laughs> Thanks, Nick. Um, before I introduce our reader today, I'd like to um, uh, mention one book. Meaning a Cloud by John Marshall was just released this week. Uh, John is the co-owner of Open Books, one of only two poetry-only bookstores in the country, and we're lucky to have him in Wallingford. So if um, the council members are looking for poetry books, I recommend Open Books. Thank you. This week, I've been thinking about public and poetry. I, I admire this program uh, poetry as part of the public record, what a great idea, I think. So I ended up looking up the word public. It comes from the Latin populus, 
which means people. So public are activities done for the people, in front of the people, well, like this meeting, publicly. And um, while I was looking up public, I found the word pub, you know, for the tavern, and it's short for public drinking house. Um, so I thought, well, that's cool. That's a place where people talk publicly, discuss public matters, and, well, drink publicly as well there. Um, then I imagined, wouldn't it be cool if the People's Party had started in a pub? And so I went to Wikipedia to check my assumption. Well, that wasn't true, but I did find out that the third governor of Washington State was from, uh, elected in 1897, was from the People's Party. So I thought, well, that's pretty cool. And so I read a little bit about the People's Party, uh, mostly a Western political movement. And then the party members were called at the time populists. So populists today survives 100 years later, not as a political party, but as um, something that appeals to the common public and not established interests. So that's today's poet's appeal, I think. What um, our poet, who happens to be the current poet populist of Seattle, um, his poetry is concerned with what people are concerned with and not, not necessarily the establishment, I think. So it's my pleasure to welcome today's reader, Cody Walker. He lives and teaches in Seattle. His, he has recent work in Best American Poetry, Parnassus, Slate, and Subtropics. Um, he's the current Seattle Poet Populist, elected in 2007. His first book, Shuffle and Breakdown, will be published by Waywiser Press this fall. Cody? Great. Well, thank you so much, John, and thanks to the council also for inviting me. I, I was asked to mention a few things, um, a few things I'll be doing um, at, uh, for my role as poet populist. Um, April, as people may know, is uh, National Poetry Month, and on April 8th, I'll be leading a class with my excellent friend Catherine Wing uh, called How to Write Poems That Double as Jokes uh, at 826 Seattle. That's a fundraising event at 7 p.m. on the 8th. And on April 20th, I'll be reading at the Central Library at 2 in the afternoon. On April 24th, I'll be reading at the Hugo House as part of their Cheap Wine and Poetry event at 7 o'clock, and I believe wine is a dollar. Um, and on April 26th, I'll be reading at the Burning Word Festival on Whitby Island at a time yet to be determined. Um, the poem that I brought in for today is called Update, and it goes like this. My latent superpowers, well, they're back. Obliterate a marriage with my mind, but which the president, that lying sack of Cody, take it slow. In time, I'll find, please note I'm speaking as my therapist, the equilibrium that time affords. I've also rerouted, I have a list, one, my neural pathways, and two, some fjords. America's a country for the lonely, the loony, Whitman said it years ago. Remember, he could fly, and he was only an editor, a winged, bearded schmo. My powers have increased a hundredfold since you left, maybe a thousand, all told. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Street vision number one. Fallen pigeon in the middle of the street, getting ready to die, and the world around it. Street vision number two. She parked her car in the south lot, lost her gold braided metal beret, and a pair of glasses in the red eyes of case, her perfume scarf soaked in rain. Number six. While the red hand shines, I remember their young faces, their smiles, their graces. Cold wind blows down Fairview. Texas Twang. I know I'm late, very late, so late, but not too late. I got caught up in Grandpa's Texas Twang. Melodic voice, accordion strokes, Tex-Mex polka and corridos, north and south of the border. Orange groves, apple orchard stories of sweat and pride. No borders, no limits, just free. I love that Texas Twang. Que viva Texas. Polaroid dreams, sepia tones of youth arranged in squares. I see myself writing dates, 
on white bottom space. Mexico City morning dream. Slow viaducto crawls across town, asphalt, cement, buried temple, rebar to the next cantina. Dos cervezas, por favor. Thank you. Thank you. And this week I've been thinking about AIDS, the noun, versus AIDS, the verb. Uh, AIDS, the noun, is an acronym. Uh, acronyms are used to shorten or simplify a concept or give us an easier way to talk about or recall a sometimes complicated name, like acquired immune deficiency syndrome. But acronyms can also hide things. It's hard to tell sometimes what a committee does, what a term means, what a, syn what a syndrome really does to a person. AIDS, the verb, is clear. It's action we can all understand. Um, I think AIDS, the verb, is what our poet today is about, to help and to assist. Juline Tripp Weaver works in HIV AIDS services in Seattle. She won third prize for poetry from the Un Unfinished Works Contest sponsored by the AIDS Services Foundation in Orange County. In September 2007, Finishing Line Press um, published her chapbook, Case Walking and AIDS Case Manager Wales for Blues. A poem from her chapbook was read by Garrison Keeler recently on the Writer's Almanac. Jolene? Thank you very much. I, I work at Lifelong AIDS Alliance here in Seattle, and they're having their Dine Out for Life on April 24th, so there are several things you could do that evening. Um, it would be great. I'm going to read two poems that are what I call echo poems about a, a person at different times in their life. Barb and Dory. Each holds 20 years of AIDS. Mother, daughter, miracle team. Dory leans up to me, says, the most important thing about this party is seeing my mother happy. Her mother leans up to me, says, I want more than just being a mother to this 19-year-old. Living with AIDS, giving care to her daughter, all she wants is time to herself. Barb takes full responsibility for this child she bore with HIV, nurses her back to health each time there is sickness. She loves her more than anything, proudly sh shows off baby pictures at the party. Barb tells us how Dory, in frustration, cut off her two ponytails, exclaims, isn't she beautiful? This dwarfed girl with jagged hair, thin as a rail, big breasts, 19 years old, miracle child. This pure love bond of 20 years, like any mother-daughter team, only different. We all love these two women. We cheer them on, for it never ends. That Dory will find her own apartment, that each will have a full life, find the dreams they seek. Tonight, Barb sings a cappella, does scat. 20 years into this altered reality, Barb and Dory are pioneers. Dory, midlife. Dedicated to Dorian Brian, born July 11, 1983, died September 13th, 2003. She crosses to the open door, the welcome arms on the other side. She is gone now, only 20 years old. We mourn our loss. Does she hold back? Look to her mother too soon to say goodbye? We must wonder at the threshold of life, her midlife only 10. We must wonder, as we say goodbye, will she linger, a spirit, at her mother's side? We will count our days, watch the calendar, wonder where our true middle age lies. Sunday is grocery shopping day for my wife and me. We go as a couple, plan the week's meals as we walk each aisle. We we start with the fruits and vegetables and always end at the deli. It's fairly efficient, and we've never been afraid to go to the supermarket. It's mundane 
and necessary, but never dangerous. Our poet today provides one possible reason we return home safely. Michael Shine of Ballard is a poet and novelist whose work appears in many journals, including Slow Trains, Chrysanthemum, Ledge, Pontoon, Elysian Fields, Rock Salt Plum, Runes, Lilies and Cannonballs, and Drash. Michael's work has received honors, including most recently, finalists at the 2007 San Francisco Writers Conference and a 2008 Pushcart nomination, which is very cool. Michael is on the board of the Washington Poets Association, director of the Lit Fuse Poetry Workshop, executive director of Teton Arts and Humanities, and a volunteer member of the ACLU Washington Speakers Bureau. Um, he's real connected with the poetry community and the community and an activist, so I'm, I'm really proud to introduce Michael. Thank you very much, John. And thanks to Nick Licata and the council for having poets here and to Frank Video for helping to organize this. Um, the British romantic poet Percy Shelley said, poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world, which is a pretty good gig. <laughs> Probably better than being an acknowledged legislator sometime, <laughs> but the pay isn't as good, perhaps. Uh, I think this still shows the wisdom of, of uh, Nick Licata's program, for which I'm thankful. My poem today is called In the Checkout Line. It is Tuesday, a little before 6 o'clock, and the checkout lines are backed up so far that carts block the aisles. The shoppers are tired, they've worked all day, and now their domestic chores resume, wheeling the cart, squeezing the legumes, selecting between brands of tuna. Before them lies more traffic, the mewling cat or spouse, bruised fruit, dinner to cook, sullen teenagers who balk when asked to help with the dishes, yet miraculously, they are not grouchy. A faded woman in a bright scarf pushing a cart laden enough to feed an Ethiopian village steps aside for a hunched man clutching one pound of ground chuck. The checker, who will be on her feet till 10, jokes with a man whose toddler romps like an untethered goose through fields of Snickers and Baby Ruths while a young couple goofs on headlines from the weekly world and inquirer, tofu is plot by aliens. Hillary spanks Obama. The shoppers, bovine in their gentle herding and shifting, breathe the fluorescent air with the patience of beasts who know they will be milked and fed and bedded down. They mean well, take turns, use dividers, choose between paper and plastic. Don't abuse the express lanes. When the bomb detonates, I decide not to permit it to knock a single can off the soup display. This is my poem. These are good people. So just for today, the jagged fragments will slip through the spaces between sighs, bounce off the ozone like tiny meteorites of forgiveness on a cloudy night, unseen, harmless, allowing these weary folks to be home in time for dinner. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I love libraries, and I love living in a city where other people love libraries. <clears throat> I love that feeling walking into a library. The, I think it's that excitement of everything that I don't know. Um, the only other place I get that feeling is Home Depot. It, <laughs> it, it's all the possibilities. I also like the words associated with a library. Stacks reminds me of pancakes, and I love pancakes. Catalog, I, I remember all those days at college thumbing through the old card catalog. That was such a, that's such a cool feeling. Dewey Decimal, isn't that a great word? Isn't that a great phrase? And if you look it up, uh, poetry is in the 811s of the classification system when you get to, when you get to the library. And spine or the part of the book that you see when it's on the shelf. And spine made me think of backbone, and backbone is what brings us to our poet today. I think her poetry, no, I know her poetry has a lot of backbone. She has strength in words 
and a strong storyteller. She's also strong in her commitment to encouraging and sharing poetry in our community. Lynn Miller is a librarian at the Ballard branch of the Seattle Public Library. Two things she loves best about her job. First, the Ballard Library staff loves and promotes the arts. They and she can encourage the love of poetry in large and small ways in their work every day. Second, that by design, the public library draws everyone in. Eventually, all of the unique and interesting people in our city find their way to the library. People keep her work infinitely interesting, as you're about to find out. Lynn? Thank you, John. Thank you, Nick. And the poem I'll read today is uh, about one of those people, and uh, her name is Teresa Papandro. And the poem was written in March 2004. Teresa, when I heard you were dead, I bought pink tulips at Ballard Market on the way home from the library and stopped at your house, where your shopping cart was still parked under the carport. I flung those tulips over your gate, and they landed on your steps. Goodbye, Teresa Papandro, I said. It was in the wee hours of grocery shopping at Ballard Market that I first observed you clad in black from head to toe, leaning on your shopping cart, nursing a Dixie cup of complimentary coffee, squinting through thick glasses from under a black hood, a streganona come to life in the brightly lit aisles. I was always hurrying out to grab a few things and get home, but you were never in any hurry, leisurely strolling and sipping. Then I began to notice you everywhere as you made your rounds, always walking in the street, never on the sidewalk. Black in summer, black in winter. You were like a brave and lonely wasp, your skirts brushing through the garden gate brushing the pavement, nosing your shopping cart down eight toward Fred Meyer for a sale on 10 pounds of flour, expecting traffic to part for you, our yaya. Some of us have been given more than we can contain of happiness. And I always thought you took our measure of sorrow and more sorrow. Teresa Papandro, husband gone, money and tiny supply, you were a puddle of black in this neighborhood of well-to-do-ness. Teresa Papandro, once of Greece, we will lay tulips and spring flowers on your walk. We will pause beside the gardens you cordoned off with caution tape. We will take your black skirts and cape and hoist them high over Seattle and sail them back to Greece to your village. Console ourselves for our loss of this woman who made her way and grew old in our village, without phone, without electricity, without a car, without English, without, 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 and yet with something that is life, that keeps itself going. And it is now we who are without you, Teresa Papandro. Thank you, Lynn. As we always do, we begin with Wordsworth, which is a uh, rendition by a local poet uh, with original work. And it's curated by John Burgess, who's also a local poet. And John is going to uh, introduce our poet today. Thanks, Nick. One of the joys of poetry for me is rhyme. I love Dickinson's slant rhyme, Bob Dylan, the way he'll slide pronunciation for that rhyme, and uh, hip hop. Isn't it amazing how the words rappers find a rhyme? Uh, I like internal rhyme schemes just as much as end rhyme. Sometimes it's the act of discovering what the poet was up to with rhyme that's really fun for me. Rhyme also provides a clue to form. Is it a sonnet? Is it a villanelle? Is it a lullaby? Our poet today is the best kind of rhymer. His rhyme is natural, not forced. It's surprising in a pleasing way and it's, it's fresh. So. Eric McHenry is the author of Pot Scrubber Lullabies, which won the 2007 Kate Tufts Discovery Award and was a finalist for the Washington State Book Award. He's an editor of Columns Magazine at the University of Washington and reviews poetry for the New York Times Book Review and other publications. It's really great that uh, Eric could join us today. Welcome, Eric. Eric. 
Thank you. Thanks for having me, and thank you, John, for that introduction. I hope I can live up to it. Uh, I'm just going to read the title poem from my collection, Pot Scrubber Lullabies. Um, it's a poem that, that I wrote shortly after the birth of my first uh, child. He used to go to sleep after taking a bottle on my lap. Uh, he was small enough to do that at the time this was written. And once I had just gotten him to drift off and was going to enjoy a few moments of peace, and suddenly the dishwasher, which I hadn't realized had been on until this time, shut off, and the dishwasher shutting off awakened the baby, and it was a disaster. But I got a decent poem out of it, so, uh, so this is Pot Scrubber Lullabies, a poem in two parts. The pot scrubber completes a cycle so vigorous the knives were rattling, and pauses, waking Evan Michael, who finds all silences unsettling. There's no resemblance. It's too early. Everything is still so round. But we have occurred to him as surely as silence has occurred to sound. And when he's finished sharpening into himself, and when we've blurred, we're going to go on happening in silence like he's never heard. I wore him like a broken arm all summer, slung from my right shoulder in a paisley hammock so deep the sides closed over him. When I walked, he swung and slept, lulled by the time his body kept against my stomach. When I stopped, I had to sing. Thanks very much. Thank you. I appreciate that. If the Seattle poetry community had its own beauty salon, it would be Open Books, the poetry-only bookstore in Wallingford. It's where you can catch up on the latest gossip, who's got a new book out, uh, talk local politics, who's reading where, browse the latest poet styles and lit journals, or pick up a classic or overlooked jewel. Um, and drop-ins are always welcome. So if anyone wants to visit Open Books, you certainly should. Uh, to finish this off, I would have to say today's poet is the barber. He'll, re he'll recommend just the right look or book for you. Uh, J.W. Marshall's first book of poetry, uh, Meaning a Cloud, won the 2007 Field Poetry Prize and was published in 2008 by Oberlin College Press. Along with Christine Diebel, his wife, he owns and operates Open Books, a, po a poem emporium, a poetry-only bookstore in Seattle, one of only two such stores in the country, which is really, really cool, especially if you're a poet and you want to browse <laughs> poetry books. His poetry has appeared in Alaska Quarterly Review, Cranky, Field, Lit Rag, Raven Chronicles, and several other magazines. His two chapbooks, Taken With 2005 and Blue Mouth 2001, were published by Woodworks, and each was a finalist for the annual Washington State Book Award. I'm really honored to introduce J.W. Marshall. Thank you, thank you, John. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Hello. Uh, two short poems. First poem, our neighbors passed the bar exam, but too many lawyers now, so she's all ramen and Judge Judy. Your Honor, if I had his shoes on, I'd pay the alimony. A job involving personality and smarts is all she's after. Convivial is not the kind of visitation you have in mind, the judge told him. Next, your news at five. Criminal intent in one local dealership. And the second poem, uh, with a Northwest theme and our, you, you know, our, our overarching military um, cloud. Not let across the Hood Canal. Like public funded art, it is a threat. Makes the traffic stop because a tender's opened up the bridge. The surfaced submarine is heading out, that tendon in the global lurk and shove. At the railing, oohs and ahs. The hills around are green as stacked green towels. Children roar to life like tassels. Yes, the wind will make you okay, Terry. 
A trident sub is canary black, is black, is solitary as a mile marker. We have everywhere to be and have to wait. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Frank Video will introduce our poet today. Thanks, Nick. Um, John sends his regrets. Can't be here today, so I'm standing in the Is, your, is your microphone on? Too? I hope it is. Can okay, there you hear go. Me out Speak there. right into yes. it. Yes. How about, oh, there we go. Um, Mary Lou Sinelli works as a writer and a public speaker. Her latest essays appear on the op-ed pages of the Seattle Times, the Seattle Post-Intelligencer, Seattle Metropolitan Magazine, and are periodically aired on national public radio. She is the author of eight collections of poetry. Her latest entitled Small Talk and a recent collection of essays entitled Falling Awake. She presents her stage reading of her book The Immigrant's Table uh, throughout the country and will open in New York City's Tenement Museum Theater in 2008 this year. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, please lend your ears for Mary Lou Sinelli. I'm gonna share one poem with you called Train Headed East any of you who want to take a day off might want to get on the Amtrak and head east, which is what I did and like to do. Train headed east. At first, I wanted romance and wonder, am I getting lazy? There was no carafe of wine shared between us in the lounge car or tea served on white linen. And not because such luxuries are impossible on American trains, but because ever since boarding, I don't want anything other than aimlessness. I don't want to work on improving the worst of me or at sliding the future into place. Geography is enough, even more than enough. It's wide open sky. It's one field running into the next. It's flowers I can't name next to shrubs I can't name under trees I can't name. And it's those chicken coops we creep by on our way out of town. I want pleasure to rise and expectation to lie flat. And I also want trivial things. I want a newspaper plucked from the trash and I admit that half a bag of M&Ms. Gladly, I leave the city behind, the grandiose lawns lush beyond rainfall, the filling up that creates a void, you know? The compromise, the next best thing, the excuse that is just fear talking, and the want that always returns. Yes, one could call traveling a loss of bearings in order to find them, or else a search for balance, one of my apparent skills, which, like all the others, has brought me little profit, and yet, everything I need. Thank you so much. <laughs> Woodsworth, which is uh, curated by John Burgess, and John's going to introduce our poet today. Thanks, Nick. One of the powers of the poet and poetry is the ability to make things personal. Issues and events are often beyond our comprehension or control. Think war, AIDS, earthquakes, hurricanes. Poetry can express an individual's response to those events. A poet humanizes the headlines. It's our way of creating or joining the emotional dialogue. There's a long tradition of making things personal in American poetry, starting with Walt Whitman tending to the wounded during the Civil War at the National Hospital in Washington, DC. Uh, last month, we had Julian Weaver, and she brought her poetry about her work as an AIDS caseworker. Um, our poet today continues to make things personal for us, be it the war or her child's illness. Suzanne Edison was recently awarded two grants, one from Four Culture and one from the City Artist Program, to complete a chapbook of poems dealing with living with a child with a chronic illness. This year, the Bellingham Repertory Dancers chose her poems for new choreography. Her work has appeared in Drash, Northwest Mosaic 2008, Cascade, the Washington Poets Association Anthology, Face to Face, Women Writers on Faith, Mysticism, and Awakening, Poetry on the Buses, 2004, and both print and online journals. She lives, in, um, she lives with her husband and daughter in Seattle. I'm pleased to introduce Suzanne. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure and privilege to be here and to actually have an audience as well. This first poem I wrote 
several months before the fifth anniversary of the Iraq invasion. Um, I know there was a lot in the press afterwards, and I've been sort of, like many people, I'm sure, following it for a long time. The name of this poem is called Tolling. Each corporal, private, first class, lieutenant, in lieu of faces, Silvo, Zawade, I collect their names. Clippings bulge the bowl of the dead, will not settle after five years at war in a country whose sand I've never tasted. Names roll in my mouth, Mosul, Bakuba, Kirkuk. The hot spots on Google Earth light up, flagging points of interest. Does anyone collect the missing limbs, name them keepsakes, pack them on ice, or set them adrift, tethered to promises of change, small flames floating in oil? Uh, I was involved with a um, every month, well, for the last couple of years, there's been an August postcard poetry project where we send out a poem on a postcard every day for the month of August. And after about a week, you start receiving them, and which is really fun and exciting, and you never know what you're going to get. And sometimes you'll write the next poem in response to the one you've just gotten, or sometimes it's a picture on the postcard. And this one started out as a response to somebody who was um, confessing her... Uh, failings as a human being, uh, brave as a poet to do that on a postcard because you know who's reading that. This one's called Slaking Fear. The sky will not judge you wanting a cracked icicle dripping. The sweet grass will not gossip your out of tune cricket song longings or knotted fears. Spit your sour kernels into furrows, fractured soil. In autumn, they return grapes, sugar from split skins. We've been talking a lot about word of mouth or referral marketing at work lately. The marketing industry is buzzing with the ways to get customers to recommend your products or services to your friends and family without big ad budgets. Word of mouth fits perfectly with social media, internet and text messages, Basically, they're short, opinionated comments between friends. Um, I also think it fits pretty well with poetry. Our po poetry community is really a network of word of mouth. You gotta hear this poet, or you gotta read this poem. Also, poets take the message, usually fairly short and opinionated, directly to the people, usually family and friends. In fact, word of mouth is how we found today's poet. We heard from another poet that we just had to have her read. Marta Sanchez, who lives in the Queen Anne neighborhood, has read at the Albuquerque Poetry Festival and Bumper Shoot. She's been at the Seattle Poetry Slam team, recorded on a slam CD, portrayed a haiku butterfly, co-authored a play, and currently advises a student poetry group. Her work can be found in Conquests and Rebellions, Nobody's Orphan Child, and other anthologies. Marta's lyrical works involve real and imagined obstacles, politics, aging, sex, sexuality, death, and racism. Marna Sanchez. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. I feel like I should have brought my more political pieces. <laughs> the first piece I'll be reading is Soothing the Stone. Left foot lifts and moves forward. Slide back to the side. My arms drift through the air. I need to sweat. Pointed toes walk the tightrope. My thighs widen with each step. Arabesque, I need the wind. My hands trail my breast, follow the beads dripping from my tilted forehead. Watch her free, I need to spin. Turn and whirl, shift slow, slow shift to blow. Center point of balance, rise up, trace my skin, enjoy the heat. Fingers intertwine overhead, release. Each nail finds the bird, I need the lines. My feet planted, I bend at the waist, every neuron remembers. This next piece, uh, 
my uh, property manager slash owner is now investigating the foundation damage due to, from the windstorm of 2006. So I thought I needed to read this piece. Bess, fingers scratched the glass, more urgent with each gust. Doors rattled to break free, prying hinges, frames bust, back and forth, forth and back. Comfort in thrashing, limbs catch air, trees crack to their hearts, houses implode. She calls in the note. Three steps away, a baby still sleeps, sucking its thumb, decorating a neighbor's garden, impaled on a crib post. The border collie's bark merges with the short-legged dash hound, new breed born, one body, two heads. Red, 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 thick liquid yarn, knitting ningle, needle, needle dangles from the eye. Distraught mother chases her tail. Skyward, the elements argue. She glances down, stretching, reaching for her calves. Sheets surge. Goldie searches for the ocean. Lid lidless garbage cans roll the street. Grass, now glass, shine the way. A sonata of howls unleashed. Shh, the rain comes. Sheets wrap her, letting her curls return. Drops soaked till weighted. Her body glistens, craving exhaustion. She inhales down low, each release, putrid satisfaction. Thank you, Marta. Much appreciated. S spiders. I've been seeing spiders everywhere the past two weeks, cleaning out our basement, behind the couch, in the morning shower. I've also been hit with a lot of spider webs on my way to the bus in the morning. I'm the first one to walk that way since the spiders work the night before, I guess. In the fall, these spider webs uh, will be revealed by morning dew, making things easier to navigate. But mostly, you never know where you'll find spiders. In, in that way, I think they're a lot like poets. You'll never know where we'll show up, at an insurance company, uh, in a convent, or at a city council meeting. <laughs> Our poet today, Madeline DeFries, is originally from Oregon and has lived in Seattle since 1985. She's the author of eight poetry collections, the most recent, Blue Dust and Spectral Waves from Copper Canyon Press. She has written two nonfiction memoirs of her nearly 38 years as a sister of the Holy Names. Madeline has taught at UW, uh, University of Montana, Holy Names College in Spokane, and University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Her prizes and awards include a Guggenheim a Fellowship in Poetry, the Lenore Marshall Prize, a National Endowment for the Arts Prize, and two Washington State Governors Awards. I'm really honored to have Madeline DeFries with us today. Thank you, um, John. I'm going to start today with a, an, a very old poem called Skid Row. The word praise appears in line two, and that's spelled P-R-E-Y-S. <laughs> Out of the depths have I cried, O Lord, where the lean heart prays on the hardened crust, where short wicks falter on candle hopes and winter whips at a patchwork trust. From darkened doorways no welcome shines, no promise waits up the broken stair, and the coin that summons the night with wine buys a morning of sick despair. Out of the depths have I cried in vain, and the still streets echo my lonely calls. All the long night in the moaning wind, the bruised reed breaks and the sparrow falls. Um, I tried to collect a reasonable research library at, in my home so that I wouldn't have to spend a lot of time running to the library whenever I wanted to look something up. And one of my favorite reference books is Brewer's Dictionary of Phrase and Fable. So this poem is called The Spider in Brewer's Dictionary. Opened, the book released a small spider, pale, nearsighted, 
anonymous, no doubt a scholar of phrase and fable who preferred investigating the shadows. Under the kitchen's public light, the spider flinched in the sudden fluorescence. The meaning I wrenched from this brief encounter, sweetest to die, doing the work you love best. Thank you very much, Madeline. I think being a community organizer counts as experience. You learn how things run and how to get things done. The poetry community counts on its organizers. They're the ones running weekly or monthly open mics, risking personal bankruptcy to operate small presses to keep poetry they believe in in circulation, and editing poetry <laughs> journals, both in print and online. Um, there are plenty of poets I would vote for if they ran for public office, including today's poet. <laughs> Lana Heckman Ayers grew up in New York City and spent over a decade in New England before making her move to the Seattle area three years ago. She's a Hedgebrook alum, poetry editor of the 25-year-old Seattle-based lit, lit journal Crab Creek Review, and, and co-curator of two poetry reading series on the east side. She has three published collections, Love is a Weed, Dance from Inside My Bones, and Chicken Farmer, I Still Love You. Her poems appear in such local magazine as Seattle Woman and Stringtown. Lana runs Concrete Wool, her own small chapbook press, which is very cool. Facilitates writing workshops at conferences such as Centrum in Port Townsend, and is a professional manuscript consultant. She enjoys sushi, gray days, perfect for Seattle, <laughs> and anything by Miles Davis. Lana? Thank you, John. Thank you all for having me here. A lot of people say a picture is worth a thousand words, but the poet and writer Chris Abani says, language creates the world that we live in. And I hope that he's right, because I've always been better with words than with art, much to the dismay and disappointment of my art teacher. Anything I would try to draw a house, a cat, a tree, it looks like a plate of spaghetti. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I wrote a poem to the art teacher. And it starts with an epigraph from the poet William Carlos Williams. And no whiteness lost is so white as the memory of whiteness. To the art teacher. You asked me to sketch wind, paint laughter, draw ambition. You might as well ask me to capture time with a butterfly net. Trap it in a mayonnaise jar. I don't think in brush strokes. When I sleep, my hands are not unconsciously shaping death from terracotta clay. All I know are words. I can tell you what yellow tastes like in soup, the way red smells in the morning, how blue feels against your skin. I can rhyme the song of green. I write the word apple, and you begin to wonder, Macintosh or Golden Delicious. You imagine the smooth ball of apple in your right hand, roll it around, bring it up to your mouth as if for a kiss, crisp it between your front teeth. This is how far you can go with words. The saying of them, setting them free to fly around inside your chest, like bees searching for flowers to make honey. Tell me, is there a way to pollinate with paint? Can I take this white page, apply colors to give you what you ask. This dream with no words and teeth of rain. I admire storytellers, balladeers, epic poets, the ones among us who can move us, teach us, remind us with their stories. 
What's cool is the power of storytelling has only increased in our information data age of computers and internets. There remains something special about voice and listening to that voice that connects us. It's the same power voice has when you speak up at a city council hearing or listen to stories around the campfire and um, maybe the North Cascades wilderness. Our poet today is a storyteller who builds bridges between places and times. Marianne Mormon is a word artist and consultant who is currently writing Asia, a musical play on immigration under Department of Neighborhood Youth Leadership Grant. She teaches at Hugo House, the Rainier Valley Cultural Center, and tells stories as Aunt Mama every Sunday morning on KBCS FM. Marianne? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> John said I could add anything I wanted to, and I think the only thing I need to add to that is uh, I spent about 20 years coming to chamber when we were diversifying and working with affirmative action. That was back when chambers, you took that little rattly old elevator up and there was no view <clears throat> and after doing that for many years I went if I'm ever going to get back to the business of writing I have to stop and get back to the business of writing so it is delightful to come back to city council chambers to such a beautiful city council chambers when there's actually a guardian of poetry thank you very much thank you very much and uh, and read and I picked this one out because I I looked at the schedule I looked at city council schedule and I thought, well, this might be a piece that you all could relate to. It's called Fantasy in Rain. <coughs> all of us learn there are lines between chaos and creativity, recklessness or courageousness, life or death. Broken lines blur in Seattle after 47 days of intrepid downpour when I am down to my last nerve on Friday freeway traffic. I am late for a meeting. I do not want to, but I am going to because I am sane. And sane people go to meetings. Meetings inked on daytimer lines with Mont Blanc pins. Meetings to cast a line to problems of education, transportation, and incarceration. Meetings to follow the technology line, technology that catalogs my meetings and my handy-dandy GPS phone that navigates through traffic. Traffic that gets worse day by day because so many people come here thanks to technology that could save the planet if the Cafe Grande doesn't jangle us into illusions of prosperity, often confused with speed. I am gaining speed now. I blitzed past that big Harley Davidson at the university exit. I cut in front of the stalled Costco rig. I slit between co-eds on their cell phones and that SUV bigger than it ought to be. I like speed. I like speed a lot. Speed gets you out of the grandstands and onto the track at Sunday, Raceway Sunday, Martinsville, Virginia, home of Raceway Sunday, when hillbillies dragged stock cars around red dirt and called it Sunday, Raceway Sunday. Gentlemen, take your places. I was raised with a lot of uh, folks who were bigoted, backward, and beautiful, and they worship the gasoline gods, and I, oh God, I could not wait to leap over those mountains, leap the class line, and join the elegance, the educated, the important world of sane people who are counting their digital seconds off in Friday traffic, and I want to jump now, jump, jump on the back street, jump, 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 go faster, go faster, and... It's a bus, a bus, a great big bus, gasping water, gotcha bus. A six foot bus sign stares at me. I can make out a woman, her arms somewhat over her head and I, I get closer and closer and I finally can read, you may be suffering from bipolar disorder. <laughs> I may, I, I may. And she asked me, 
about my headaches, my sleepless nights, my depression, my mood swings. My mood swings at Friday, 5 o'clock traffic. The gray woman on the wet gray sign invites me to call a toll-free number, but I don't have a pen, and my phone will not boot up in time to enter the number where I might get help, where I could get help if I suffer. Could I suffer? Yes, perhaps I do suffer in every fiber of my red dirt, hillbilly bones. All I want is speed, Sunday raceway, Sunday speed, speed to crush my accelerator. When the flag drops, hear the engines roar, Pedal to the metal. I could do this. I could slice into that bus, vivisect the articulated lizard, speed like blind desire over the seats, through those gigantic windows, and land in a perfect two-point arch. I stare at the gray woman and the gray sign, and I wonder if she's ever called that number. I guard against the urge to tappity-tap-tap the gas, and I calculate the odds. What is the likelihood I would land safely? And what if I hurt someone? These are not the someones I want to hurt. So, I breathe, I wait, I think. I go to meetings to find solutions so I do not cross the finish line too soon. Thank you. Baritone at the Mariners. Everybody stood. Some covered their heart with a hand, doffed their hat, and expected nothing out of the ordinary. The microphone was placed on a tripod at home plate. With his shirt tucked, M. Smith stepped up over the groomed field grass. The crowd could have been a three-tiered ring of choristers courteously waiting for the upbeat, but they were holding hot dogs with sweet relish in buns, caramel corn, pink and green cotton candy spun on sticks and bulky cups of cold beer. The baritone. Oh, oh, say, can you see? Slowed everybody down, began to lubricate the crowd. Smith took his time. A great energy exchange amplified the air. M. Smith made love with his song, caressed the bleachers, the players, the umps, security guards, and me, turned the USA's battle song anthem bravely into a love song tribute, like sliding home on honey. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you.